YouTube photo community, Colin Blundstone and the Zombies fans, random people on the internet. My name is Giggins, and we're joined here today by the incredible, amazing Colin Blundstone of the Zombies. Colin, how are you, man? <laughs> I'm, I'm very well. Thank you for the intro. That's great. Made my day. <laughs> um, I've been a big fan of you guys since I was a little kid. I'm sure you hear that story all the time, but... You know, growing up with your music, you definitely set the DNA of what rock and roll should be for me and kind of what I do. Um, so it means a lot to be able to chat with you for a little bit here and just uh, take 45 minutes of your time. So thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I wanted to ask you about doing one year live uh, recently. You've done that a couple of shows now. Yeah. What did it mean to you to perform that in full for the first time? And what was the audience reaction like? Well, uh, the audience reaction was incredible, actually. Ab absolutely a standing ovation before we started. Oh. And then um, track by track, just amazing reaction. So that was brilliant. Um, on, a, on a personal note, I, it's really quite emotional, to be honest, because that was my first solo album. It was 1971. Um, is that uh, 50, 60 years ago? Yeah. Um, of course, music can always do this. It can transport you all the way back to that time. You know, I suppose I was in my early 20s and so many memories flood back. Yeah. And it is quite an emotional experience to perform an album like that, particularly for the first time. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, on an artistic level, it's also quite a tricky album because there's lots of different kinds of music on there. And yeah. so whereas when we managed to do Odyssey and Oracle with the zombies. We re we um, we played every note live that was played on the record. You can't really do that with one year because there's big orchestras on there. There's a in effect a brass band. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's string quartets and so forth. So we can give we can give a, a very good interpretation of well uh, sorry that sounds like I'm blowing my own trumpet. You know but we can give an, <laughs> we can give an interpretation of what that album uh, was like when we recorded it but we can't really do it note for note but i gotta tell you we've got these great musicians and they work they just work their magic it's such a privilege to be working with them i can only imagine because that's such an interesting album it ranges anywhere from like baroque pop to just orchestra stuff to rock and roll it's all over the shop and it's like it's such a fascinating listen so i mean what does it mean for you that in 2024 people have such an interest in this album that you did back back in the early 70s so long ago? Like, what is that feeling like? Well, I've got to be honest with you. It's incredibly exciting that people should be interested in it now because, it, I, and funnily enough, it was really quite successful in the UK and in some countries in Europe. Yeah. But it didn't really make an impression in America yeah. when it first came out and, and you know it's very disappointing so the fact that people are interested in it now after all this time it almost intensifies the excitement that it's getting some kind of reaction it's brilliant and you know it is a bit unusual and I suppose for radio stations and and even for the press it's difficult to kind of place it you know they a lot of radio stations only play their niche of, of music right and it's very hard to work out what this is. And I think probably it's based on the fact that I was thinking about it the other day when we started this album. So Rod Argent from the Zombies and Chris White from the Zombies produced it. Yeah. And when we started this album, in a way, we were making it up as we went along. And if you think about it like that, <laughs> it might give a, a different light to this to this album because it did. It took a year. And that's why it's called One Year. And there's, but before that, the zombies always recorded very, very quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was amazed looking back that we spent a year recording this album. And partly that was because Rod was away a lot with his new band, Argent. And partly it's because we were trying to find a way musically and, and with material. A lot of that material was written during that year. Yeah. So why? Uh, um, it took as long as it did because we were, in a way, we were making it up as we went along. <laughs> and the big, the big moment for us was being introduced to the string arranger, Chris Gunning. Yeah. He just sadly, he, he passed away recently, but yeah. he was just a genius. And he came up with these wonderful Bartok-esque 
um, string quartet <laughs> arrangements that you would never in a million years think of doing a song like that. And <laughs> I just loved it. I mean, I mean, in terms of is it commercial or not, who knows? Probably, probably not, you know, certainly in the market of, of that day, it probably wasn't. And then we surprised, everyone was surprised that it was on CBS Records in this country. Yeah. would now be Sony. Um, and they uh, they put out, I think, two singles before they put out Say You Don't Mind. It was the, the third single released. It's a wonderful song written by uh, Denny Lane. Yeah. And it's just it's a 21-piece string orchestra. There's no rhythm section on it at all. Who would think that that could get airplay? <laughs> but in the crazy world of radio in 1971, it did get, it was played off the air. And it was a big hit. Yeah. It was wonderful because it got my solo career off to a to a great start. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, it didn't make much of an impression in America, but it certainly got things got things rolling over here for me. I mean, I had no idea if I had a future as a solo artist. You know, I'd, I'd been yeah. a singer in The Zombies, but it's a whole different ball game. Also, The Zombies actually finished in 1967, although right. we had a big hit after that, we finished in 67. So by now, three years has gone by. I, mean, I think mostly this album was recorded in 1970. It was released in 71. Yeah. And uh, I just had no idea what kind of reaction I would get. So to to start off with a big hit, it was, it was really encouraging. And uh, yeah, the solo career was up and running. I wanted to ask you about Say You Don't Mind because it is such an unusual construction of a song. And it was a big hit. I read somewhere that you guys, as the zombies, would do it live back in the day. Did you ever record it, too, with the zombies? Um, I'm not sure if we ever did a radio broadcast that included that song. I don't think so. But no, we never recorded it. Yeah. Um, but when when we were coming towards the end of, the, of one year, and I, I mean, it's a long time ago now, but from memory, I think we were stuck for the last song. And, you know, we were brainstorming. What can we do? What can we do? Yeah. And someone remembered that we actually used to close the show with the zombies on Say You Don't Mind. But we did it as a rock song. Right. And first of all, for this album, we recorded it. Unfortunately, Argent weren't available because Argent played a lot on this album. All the, yeah. all the most of the songs that aren't strings are Argent. And each one of them is such a wonderful player. And I, I'm such a, I'm, I'm an Argent fan. Yeah, um, <laughs> so right and uh so we, it would have been great to have got Arjun to have played on it but we didn't we got really good session players but it didn't work and then we got the idea of asking Chris Gunning to have a go at it and he came up with this sensational arrangement I mean he's just such a wonderful writer yeah who to thunk I mean who knows what would have happened if it was an Argent done song and not with Chris doing the arrangement it may have been a whole different solo career for you if it had been done absolutely that. but this is <laughs> this is one of the really exciting things about the music business that, that there are so many you come to so many crossroads and no one knows what's the right path i love it when <laughs> i'm being a little bit sarcastic here when you can get a and r men particularly do this but the managers do it as well as they they tell you what you should be doing yeah and often this conversation will end up with and that will that will give you a hit i mean it, it, the whole thing is silly. No one knows what a hit is. No. And also, a hit record in itself is not a career. Uh, you know, a hit record might give you, what, six or seven months of an active career. Right. And after that, you have to start all over again. And I, I prefer to think in terms of a much sort of broader base now to get out there and play live. Yeah. And hopefully get word of mouth that there's something happening in this live act that's worth seeing and next time you go back there are more people maybe not a lot more but you're building and that's how i like to think of a career now rather than talking about this hit singles can someone explain to me no one actually makes singles anymore <laughs> and no one buys singles because no one makes they're not available you can't buy singles i know so how can you have a singles chart yeah i don't understand it and so much of the industry is based on that singles chart. If you're yeah. in the singles chart, it's more likely you're going to get TV, you're going to get national press and any other things that go with it. 
Right. So this this strange singles chart can open many doors, but you can't buy a single. No, it's so weird now. And I wanted to ask you about that too, because like in the mid '60s, when you guys, you know, as the Zombies, you guys were writing some of the most incredible singles of the time. And one of my favorite ones you guys did was uh, you wrote "Just Out of Reach." Um, and I remember reading somewhere you said that was the second song you ever wrote, which is like, <laughs> it's such a great song. It is <laughs> <laughs> such a great song, man. Um, but that song has all the makings of an absolute smash hit. And it's like, you know, what is a hit? What is not a hit? You know, it worked for She's Not There and Tell Her No. But like, you know, why wasn't a song like Just Out of Reach a huge success? And it's like, it must have been one of those head scratching moments when you're sitting there waiting for the charts to come in and be like, well, where is it? You know, like, what's that? Yeah, like? I mean, there are so many things that make up a hit record. Obviously, I always think the song is the most important thing. If you yeah. haven't got a good song, you can all pack up and go home. That's what I always say. The <laughs> song is the most important thing. But then, you know, then in terms of the studio, the arrangement, the players, the engineer stroke producer, yeah. and then you get into the record company, you know, how committed are they to the record? What kind of promotion and marketing are they going to put behind it? And then it's just timing as well. You know, yeah. is it the right time for the record? And finally, as important as anything else, is luck. <laughs> you just need a little <laughs> bit of luck. And all these things, all the stars have to align, you know. And it's always made me laugh because when you have a hit record, boy, is it easy. It just happens. And you think, ah, oh, man, this is like falling off a log. We can do this time and time again. <laughs> you know, the, the next one, the next one, nothing happens. Yeah, uh, it's it's extraordinary. And that's why I try not to think too much about hit singles. Yeah. And just try to think about careers. It's really important to write. I think it's really important. It's, it seems obvious to me to play live and as as much yeah. as possible. You're learning your craft apart from anything else. Yeah. How can you, you know, play live in a in a, a professional way if you're not experienced in playing live? You, you have to. Yeah. And um, that's how careers are uh, are established, in my humble opinion. And what I love about you guys, too, is that, like, you're making some of the best music of your career right now. Like, Different Game was my favorite album of last year. It's, like, it's one of the best albums I've heard in a very long time. Oh, thank you. It, it's truly, it's something really special. And I um I did a review for it last year, and Rod made a little video to thank me for on your guys' Instagram page. And I was just like, holy crap, Rod Arjun knows I exist. Like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> talking to you it's like this is an absolute dream come true but uh no like hearing you guys so stoked and so hungry and eager to prove that good art and great songs don't know a decade or a generation good music will always find its audience um you know when you go out there now and you see probably kids in the audience and people who are in their 50s or 60s seeing that huge gap of people that's got to be a trip to see people who are still discovering you in 2024 and you guys were making songs when you were 18 years old. Like, how does that feel? I know, it, it's one of the things that it's, it's so energizing when you, you see a zombies audience and you see such a cross section of ages there. Obviously, you know, we've got people that have followed us from 1964. Wow. But, but we've got their grandchildren, probably their great grandchildren <laughs> in the audience as well. And it's such a lift when we walk out and see that and yeah. i'm so glad that you you liked a uh, different game the album you know i mean i it, i can i see it yeah and <laughs> um you know the band was playing really really well yeah. right up until this summer you know we we played a big uh, concert at the barbican in, in london and uh, yeah. we had some lovely guests on there amongst them was uh, paul weller who's a huge oh. star over here huge and um, it was such a magical evening and it was it was just a few weeks later that Rod sadly had his stroke, and yeah, yeah. Um, you know he's doing well. He's doing really really well. Good. Um, okay. But he has decided that he's not going to tour anymore. Yeah. Um, so for now, that's that's how things are. You know, I I, I want I do wonder sometimes maybe when he feels better, and it's going to take time. Yeah. But maybe we could do, you know, perhaps a couple of promotional gigs for a new album because he definitely wants to keep writing and he yeah. definitely wants to keep recording. So we'll, we'll yeah. see what happens, but I don't think there'll be any more long tours. I, I think that's gone now.
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that too. I'm glad he's doing well. That's we were all hoping. Oh, he well. is definitely. I, I was with him yesterday. Uh, oh, good. Our families meet up quite a lot, and and we had lunch together yesterday, and he was in. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. I wanted to ask you about him because I know you guys have been friends since you were kids. You were like 15 when you met. Yeah. So what does it mean to be working with him and be friends with him for all these years? And have stayed in touch with him when you guys weren't the zombies. <laughs> I know. Uh, off, I mean, there was a gap when the zombies weren't playing, but we were still working together. Very often, Rod would either write for me or produce for me, and I would turn out for shows that he was doing. And so we have been working together since we were 15. So obviously, there's a very tight connection between us. And on, on the one thing, as a performer, I always feel safe on stage with Rod. Yeah. I know that whatever happens we can plow through right. uh, i also i know he's a superb musician and the arrangements and the way he plays it's it's a real lift as a performer when you've got someone like that yeah. on stage with you and, and a thing that maybe i've always known but i've wanted to voice this summer and say that i would never have had a career in the music business without him because right. he was a sensational musician even at 15 he was breathtaking and um, uh, he was definitely, he was the founder of the band. It was his idea. He was the leader of the band. He wrote most of the important songs and he arranged most of the tracks, if not all the tracks. Yeah. So he's been a huge part of my life. And I hope that we, I don't see any reason why we should um, slow down in terms of uh, writing and recording. And I, I really look forward to our next adventure. It's going to be a slightly different kind of adventure, but that's yeah. fine. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, I know the fans are still hungry for new stuff from you guys. Um, there was a track that came out on that Zombies Heaven box set a long time ago called A Love That Never Was. A yes. song I had hanging around in the 60s that I guess never got finished or got left behind. Um, I know you guys once in a while will resurrect an old zombie song or a song from your solo career for a new Zombies album. That would be a cool song to bring back because that one has such a character to it. Do you remember doing that? I, I, I remember that song, but vaguely, because if I remember correctly, you know, I sang on nearly all the songs. Yeah. But that song, I think that that's Rod singing on that song. So I had very little to do with that. It was a time when people were just putting demos down and it happened that, that I think pretty sure Rod sang that song, but certainly, yeah, we could investigate that though. I have to say that Rod has always been the one who always, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just behind him in this, but he <laughs> wants to look forward all the time. And when you say to him, you know, could we redo this song? He said, yeah, we could, but why don't we write something new? Why do you know? That's where he gets his adrenaline, you know, yeah. from, writing and 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 arranging and recording new material yeah but i'll i'll remind him of that song and see if i can get a reaction it's such a wonderful little song yeah yeah um and speaking of wonderful little things earlier this year you put out that less is more ep with songs yes. from uh, ghost of you and me record are those tracks were they done back in 2008 2009 or are they new versions for this year uh, no they're, they're they're not new they're okay. not new they, they were done some time ago and um, it, they weren't recorded with the intention of them ever being released. They're, they're, yeah. they're just demos for see what we can do with them. But my management company, The Rocks, really loved that kind of approach to the songs. Yeah. And it's a completely different approach from for me vocally. Yeah. You know, and a lot of those songs, I think three of the five songs the zombies have recorded. Yeah. <laughs> And two of those songs, I'm actually singing them an octave higher in The Zombies, with it being a sort of a, a rocky song. Right. I'm singing an octave higher. But with me singing just with a guitar, it's it seems much more natural to sing them. And I, I've been very lucky that I've kept this quite large range that I've got. So I can sing right down there, you know. <laughs> but okay. then I can I can get the high notes as well. Um, so they just liked it and they thought people might be interested in hearing the songs in their in their raw shape. And, and I'd like to do some more, even if it's just to put CDs together for uh, to sell at gigs. You yeah. know, I'd like to perhaps do five or six, seven or eight more demos. I, I, I'm, when these 
these um, live dates are over. I'm, I'm going to have a go at this um, and do some more demos. And then I've got a CD of demos that people can, uh, I don't know what the situation will be, but they'll be available for them at gigs. Because um, a lot of people have been interested in hearing the songs in their, in their raw form. They're fascinating because you have just the guitar and then like the selling point is your voice because you have one of the most incredible voices in rock and roll history. And like hearing you just on top of that singular instrument is fascinating because the song breathes so differently. Um, I love that little EP. It's one of my favorite releases of the year. So thanks for putting that out. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, kind of a random question. <laughs> I found this picture of you guys from the 60s where you're with a monkey who's holding a guitar yes do you remember anything about that i'm gonna put that i remember the session <laughs> I, re I do remember the session i think it's a chimpanzee yeah yeah i remember being very scared i would <laughs> a chimpanzee can pull your arm <laughs> off your body if it yeah. wants to and can probably give you a very nasty bite as well right. but it was i don't know whose idea it was you know people were always looking for an angle in those days you know and and that's what happened. It was, it was nothing to do with us. Um, what on earth a chimpanzee was doing in the photographer's studio in the first place, I've no idea. It's just one of those things. We yeah. were cursed with strange photos, actually. Um, I think that in the first place, we were, you know, we were very naive. We were, when we recorded She's Not There, Rod and I were 10 days apart, you know, so we're this, exactly yeah. the same age. He's June the 14th, I'm June the 24th. Yeah. Um, uh, we were 18 when we recorded She's Not There. I think by the time it was released, we were just 19. Yeah. And we were talked into doing all these kind of jumping in the air photos. Oh, yeah, yeah. cool funny faces. Do all this. It just looked dreadful. Yeah. And I think it really affected our early career. Um, and those photos, beware. If you're just making your first record now, beware. The, your first photos will follow you around for the rest of your lives, you know, and <laughs> those photos are still used now. Yeah. 65 years later uh, of us looking, jumping up in the air, pulling funny faces or sitting down with a chimpanzee and people saying, why, why are you sitting with a chimpanzee? And I can't answer it. I mean, it was the chimpanzee was just put there. <laughs> um, but I think that, yeah, we did get a slightly raw deal. And I can remember going to Decker's offices one morning and they said, you have to go to the press office. So we went to the press office and sat down with someone. And I don't know how experienced they were, but they came up with a, a, a question like, uh, you know, we need to create an image for you. And that it went from there to, so what have you done? And somebody mentioned the, um, I can't think of the word now, dreadful words of, well, we've just really finished school, which was true. Yeah. But who wants to know about a band who have just finished school? You, people want bands to be pirates and brigands and bad boys. And yeah, they're cool guys, well, yeah. Yeah, not schoolboys. <laughs> and then they expanded it. I'm, I'm reluctant to even say this because it sort of creates the thing all over again. But they expanded it by saying how many end of school exams, we have different exams to you, but, you know, how many school exams you got. And between us, we got quite a few. We were, you know, I certainly wasn't considered bright at school. I'm not, it's not false modesty. I really wasn't. Oh, same. Uh, but, <laughs> we had a few exams and this became our um oh i forgot my i lose my words now this became our image this yeah. became our image a sort of school geeks who'd passed quite a few exams i promise you yes. that there were headlines about this band which immediately and also they jump up and down in the air and pull funny faces yeah so you've got the jumping up and down in the air band with lots of school exams yeah, completely alienates most of the record buying public in one swift movement. Yeah. Especially probably the, no, all of them. I was going to say, you know, young teenage boys, but it, all of them alienated them. And we yeah. had a bit of a struggle after that. And it was a completely contrived image of us that I think did us a lot of harm. Um, it's a long time ago now. I don't know how important it is now, but it was important at the time. Yeah. I mean, do you think it impacted your 
chart success in England? Because I know in America, you guys were, I would say, more popular in America because part of the British invasion. But like, you know, how do you think? I think it did. It definitely yeah. did. Uh, first of all, there was that image problem. Yeah. Which I just described. Secondly, Decca were very pushy that you had a single every six weeks. Now, we were out working all the time. We were uh, around this time, we were put onto what they used to call a, uh, a package tour. So there would be like 50 or 16 acts. Yeah. So on our first package tour, it was the Searchers, Dion Warwick and the Isley Brothers and us and some other bands as well. And so while we were on this long package tour, especially Rod and Chris, were trying to write new songs. Yeah. They'd only discovered which she's not there, and Chris wrote the B-side, you make me feel good. They'd only just discovered they could write. They didn't have a backlog of songs. So yeah. we were we were writing as we went along. Yeah. And and Decca pressured us to release the second single as quickly as possible. We ha only had one track available. They also put out an EP, which was crazy. Because any one of the tracks on the EP, you know, an EP is like four tracks, right? A, right, a mini album. Any one of the tracks on that EP would have been stronger than the follow up single. And it was, it was written by Chris White, and Chris didn't think it was a commercial single, and it was called Leave Me Be. Yeah, and so it's following up a big hit single, and it just, it just did nothing. And the heartbreaking thing is that we knew that would happen. Well, we had a right. pretty good idea. Uh, so in America, where everything had happened a little bit later, just because we were a UK band, things were released first here. Yeah. Uh, they skipped that follow up, and Tell Her No was our follow up in America. Wow. Well, Tell Her No was our third single in the UK, and it was a small hit, but it was a much bigger hit in America. Huge in here. I mean, that's, you know, growing up as a kid with the oldies radio station, those were the songs I heard. It was Time of the Season, Tell Her No, and She's Not There. Yeah, I, remember, um, I think I was in high school when I picked up a greatest hit CD for the first time. You guys and discovered the treasure trove that was your catalog, and I was like, "Oh my god, how come these songs aren't all over the radio? They're perfect. Like these are wonderful tracks." Um, when you guys finished like Odyssey and Oracle, I know you did a lot of that yourselves. You paid for it yourselves. Like you put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that record, and then you kind of split for a little bit, um, or for a while actually. When when that ended and you took that job as an accountant, was it? Well, I mean, I took, I, to put it in context, I took the first job that was offered to me. So I, people <laughs> sometimes say to me, how could you choose, you know, to be in an office rather than be in the rock and roll industry? But the phone wasn't ringing when the zombies finished. Yeah. The, the phone wasn't ringing and I waited a while and then I, I thought, well, I have to get a job and that was the first job I was offered and it was it didn't in a way it didn't matter what it was it was a job and it was it was in an insurance a big insurance office in the center of London yeah. and the good thing about I know nothing about insurance absolutely nothing I, and I didn't then and I don't now yeah. but um <laughs> the good thing about it was it was a very busy office and so it meant I didn't have any time to dwell yeah. on the sadness of the band yeah. I was heartbroken that the band had, had finished. Yeah. But, I, you know, I just had to answer the phone with all these, you know, interesting questions about insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Believe me, if you've ever had to bluff on stage, it's a great background to insurance. Because they people would, at the end of the first day, I had some kind of introduction to the office. Yeah. It was a huge building, you know. Yeah. And uh, very Dickensian, very old fashioned. Jeez. And I had some kind of uh, introduction, and I remember towards the end of the afternoon, the, the phone rang that was nearest my seat, and everybody looked at me and sort of thought, well, <clears throat> okay, answer it. I had no education in insurance at all. I just yeah. had to answer it. And that's when my background in rock and roll really, you know, <laughs> came to the fore. Because if you if you can't bullshit, you ain't gonna last in what can happen. All yeah. insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I can only picture you just walking in with like you know your groovy long '60s hair and some cool clothes. Like, did you have to dress up for that role? Did you wear like your cool shirts and stuff, or what was that like? 
Oh no, it was as I said, it was very Dickensian. It's very old fashioned. Corporate. And yeah, you had to wear uh, a proper suit and a collar yeah. and tie. So I had, I had like, uh, I think I had two suits, and I had a a grey pinstripe suit. Oh, cool. And um, and then just a plain, a, a lighter grey one, and 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 I carried an umbrella. So. <laughs> <laughs> I had to because I had to wear derby hat. Like, you know, people still wore those bowler hats, you know. But I, I didn't. I didn't have one of those. No, <laughs> uh, but I had this umbrella, so I used to walk along with this, and I used to practice walking with a handle like that. And then it, I got very bored of doing this, and then I'd walk along with a handle like that backwards and <laughs> on the on the ground, you know. And then I would do it with my left hand. And then I would do it back with my left hand. And then I would be at the subway station. Yeah. And it was when I realized what I was doing. I think I thought, you know, maybe this isn't for me. You know, um, <laughs> I'm going to drive myself crazy. But uh, so I was I was there for nearly a year. And the oh, funny wow. thing. Yeah, I was. Uh, it yeah. might not have been quite that long, but maybe nine months or something like that. Oh. But the funny thing was I was paid so little that by the time I paid my train fare, and a bit of rent, yeah, and, and some meals. I worked out I was actually working at a loss. Oh, so geez. why I was doing it, I actually don't know. But except from the point of view of just keeping sane, you know. Yeah. Uh, then eventually, towards the end of that nine months to a year, time of the season was a big hit in the states, and the phone started ringing. And one of the guys that phoned me was a guy called um, Mike Hurst. And he was a producer and a very successful producer who, amongst other things, had just produced the very first Cat Stevens record. So uh, Matthew and Son, uh, Going to Get Me a Gun and I Love My Dog are the three that come to mind. Were they hits in America? They were big hits in the UK. They were moderate hits. He became fam more famous like when, um, you know, um, Wild World, that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. Well, they were big hits here. And, and Mike first said to me, listen, you really should be recording. And my memory of our conversations, and he started calling me at the office. I, I couldn't have <laughs> long conversations because all the phones were ringing. And I, I was reluctant, really, to commit to the music business again after the sadness of the zombies finishing. Yeah. But he said to me, look, I'll get Olympic Studios, which is wonderful studios where the stones had recently been recording in there yeah. um, and he said i'll get some tracks together you come along after you, your your day's work <laughs> after the office is closed and put some vocals down and let's see what happens oh my God. And so uh, that was my entree back into the music business somebody he swears it's not him and it wasn't me had the idea of me singing under the name of Neil MacArthur. Yeah. I don't know who came up with that idea. <laughs> I was going to be James MacArthur until like the day before the records went to be pressed. But uh, I think it was London Records in America yeah. realized that there was an actor in Hawaii Five O called James MacArthur. And they said, oh, you can't be James MacArthur. Be Neil MacArthur. <laughs> I think it was very arbitrary. And, and you see, I wasn't sure that there was a career opportunity here. So I just went along with it. And in the same way, now Mike definitely was the one who came up with the idea of re-recording She's Not There. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's an interesting idea. And it, it proved to be the right thing because it was quite a big hit. Yeah. Neil MacArthur just about crept into the top 30 with She's Not There. That's huge. In, yeah. It's like 69 or 70, somewhere around there. Yeah. And then I had, uh, I was back in the music business. The decision was made for me. I wasn't really sure if I, if I wanted to do it or not, but I didn't have a choice after that. Um, Neil had three singles, but, but the second two singles, they weren't hits. Yeah. And then I was coming home from a party with Chris White, uh, the original bass player from the Zombies. And he said to me right out of the blue, he said, look, Rod and I are producing. We have a production company. Why don't you forget the Neil MacArthur thing and come and record an album with us? Yeah. And I just I just jumped at it. And although we started off in a, another studio, um, we after a short time we were back in Abbey Road, Studio Three, 
with Peter Vince Engineering, who en engineered the majority of Odyssey and Oracle. Not all of it, but the majority of it. So it was like having the old team back together again. I got Rod and Chris producing, writing and playing. Uh, Peter Vince, and then, of course, I, I was introduced to the wonderful um, Chris Gunning, yeah. who did a lot of the arrangements who we spoke about earlier on. Yeah. So it was a great way to start a, a solo career because I was amongst friends and they were very, very supportive. That's the thing. Like It's so cool when you look back on your career and you see that you guys worked so closely with each other for so many years because when I was learning about you guys back in the day, I always wondered what happened to Chris and Paul after you guys broke up. I was, oh, where'd they go? And realizing Chris worked so closely with you guys for a number of years after that, um, yeah. it's, it's fun to see that Zombies family stuck together for so long. Um, really? Well, you know, up. we just had a, a Zombies festival in St. Albans, where we come from. Yeah. Uh, last weekend. Yeah, beginning. And it's called the the Begin Here Festival. Yeah. And I, I mean, lot, it, there's lots of things happening over the whole weekend, from lunchtime Friday to Sunday night. There's things happening all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's all based around St. Albans, which is where we all went to school, and that's how we met. Right. Um, but you can jump into these, uh, you know, on what's happening now, or you can go and have a meal and have a, it's a beautiful it's actually a city. It's quite small, but it's a city. Oh, cool. uh, so you could have a little walk around. It's it's an old Roman city. Oh, and cool. so there's, it's, it's really, really old, you know, yeah. and it's lots of uh, things you can check out. Or you can just go to everything that's arranged for zombie fans. And it's really interesting. But I mention it because Chris White was there and Hugh Grundy was there. Yeah. Sadly, Rod wasn't because he's, he's still not back to his old self. He will be, but he, yeah. he's, he's nearly there. Yeah. Uh, and, and and then again sadly Paul Atkinson um, died some years ago but yeah. you know Paul had an incredibly successful career as a record executive Paul Atkinson who was a guitarist yeah. in the original band he went on to sign so many big people I mean in the UK and Europe he, he signed ABBA who went on to sell millions and millions of records he couldn't get as it was Epic in those days or CBS to yeah. really commit to them. They did a couple of singles for CBS, but there just wasn't the traction there. But Paul got them signed here and they you know, they've just made millions and millions. And and there were there were many other big artists that um Paul discovered and and worked with. And often when we're playing, you know, on a bill with other artists, so many times they come up to us and say, We owe so much to Paul. Aww. He was really top record executive That's so cool. you know he really made it sort of on the other side of the business yeah. chris white still writes now um he's written many hits um i'd say only uh hugh is really retired he still plays in, in his own band he lives yeah. uh, on the Balearic islands they're just off of spain oh cool and, okay. and uh he's retired there he absolutely loves it and he has a local band there that yeah. he plays so he's still playing he played in the begin here festival right. he played uh time of the season with the zombies hugh grundy did and um and chris sang butcher's tale oh, and no he way. he came on he came on stage and he'd found a big old army khaki coat you know it's a proper army coat with an old-fashioned tin helmet and he came on stage and he had he sang Butcher's Town. It was, a, it was very moving because yeah. they, you know, it's a really serious song, really. Yeah. It's, it's about the first World War. Although right. a lot of people who listen to what is an oracle will probably relate to the Viet Vietnam War, but really it was written about the First World War. Yeah. Um, and Chris gives a wonderful performance of that. It's 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 quite unique and very emotional and overpowering. Yeah. when he gives his uh, his interpretation of that song. When you guys get together, you know, with the original group and you do these meetups once in a while, and sometimes they come on stage, you do shows with them. Does it take you back? Do you feel like you're 19 years old again, like playing Shindig and that kind of stuff? Or what's it feel like? Well, I, there is an element of that. Uh, <clears throat> but fortunately, in the last few years, since probably about 2008, we've met up quite a lot. Yeah. There was the idea of doing Odyssey and Oracle live in 2008 and originally we were just going to do one show that's all it was at the, yes at the shepherd's bush empire yeah and then there was such demand for tickets that grew into three shows yeah and then 
uh, a few months later, I might have crept into the next year, we did some shows around the UK. And then there was demand for us to go over next to America. Yeah. And so we've been meeting up quite regularly over the years since 2008. Yeah. I, mean, I think in 2008, that was very emotional, doing time of the season then. Yeah. I, I mean, I the whole of Odyssey and Oracle. Yeah. That was incredible. And it was a great show as well. We had <clears throat> a wonderful band uh, put together for that. It was the original Zombies, but some, some wonderful other players as well. Yeah. So that we could deliver every harmony, every solo, every thing that was added in the studio. We could do that. Um, so that was great fun. So since 2008, we've actually toured with the original guys quite regularly. I don't think it'll happen again. I think that's the end now yeah but uh yeah i remember it was it was um paul weller saying to us over here in the uk he's often named that as his favorite album of all yeah. time Odyssey right. and Oracle. but he said guys you know what it's my favorite album of all time but you shouldn't do it too many times because you take the specialness away from it if you do it too many <laughs> times and and he's he's got a very valid point and yeah. i think we've probably we've done it enough now it's great fun I loved doing it, particularly as we never played it at the time. I don't think we played any of those songs live. We more or less recorded the album and the band finished. Yeah. So it was, it was great for us to play them live for the first time. And to revisit some of these songs that have become massive hits, like Time of the Season. Like You guys never did that back in the day, right? No, you never played that I don't. I don't think so. You know, if we did, we, we might have done it a couple of times. Live. Yeah. Uh, and it would have only been a couple of songs. Yeah. Maybe maybe we did do that, but I, I honestly can't remember. Yeah. But it's, as it's such a long time ago, believe me, it's like doing it for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the documentary Hung Up on a Dream, too, because you guys have had such a resurgence in popularity in the last 20 years, and your records have been held in a whole different regard than they were back in the day. Um. I still have yet to see it, but I've been told by many people I'm in the movie at the beginning where I one of my little reviews is in it or something from my right. Yes. Dude, yeah. So I'm trying to get my hands on a copy. But what does it mean to you to have that documentary out where your story is told forever for the next generations to discover and learn about you guys to have your life preserved like that? What's it mean to you? Well, I mean, it is incredible. And it's it's firstly, it's totally unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I, I thought in 1967, that was the end. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think there's many bands who have had a resurgence of interest after such a long time. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I think it's a unique story. Yeah. And I'm so glad that the story got to be told. And there's a wonderful director called Robert Schwartzman who, who put this uh, documentary together. And, and I think he's done a great job. And in particular, first of all, he tells the story so well. But in particular, there was very little film of the original band. People yeah. didn't, that you know, films weren't made like they are now. Yeah. Of everything you do seems to be recorded. <laughs> that exactly. wasn't, it wasn't the way then. And so, but he's managed to find clips that, you know, I didn't even know existed. Cool. And he put together a really wonderful documentary. And I can tell you to sit there and see your life before you up on a on the silver screen, so to speak. That's a very emotional experience. It really is. Yeah. Having seen it once, I thought I really enjoyed that. Um, I don't think I'll probably watch it again, but <laughs> I did watch it, watch it again. And I enjoyed it just as much, if not more. Yeah. And, and, and I saw things in it. That like all films, I saw things in it the second time that I didn't see the first time. Right. And uh, hopefully you'll really enjoy it. I, I, I certainly did. And I know that uh, the people that I've spoken to that have, have seen the uh, documentary, sometimes in an early stage and sometimes in a final edit, yeah. but everyone has really said what a great job Robert's done. I'm excited to see it. And it's beyond an honor to be a small part of it because I've been a champion of you guys for years. Um, yes. And, you know, when Rod made that little video on Instagram and when your team contacted me to use my video for the movie, I was like, me? Like, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just a dude who loves music. You know, I'm a musician too. But 
um, you know, being a part of that movie is something that will be one of the coolest things that's ever happened in my entire life. Um, Brilliant. absolute honor to be a part of it because as I've said in multiple videos, like a lot of bands can sound like other bands, but no one can sound like the zombies. Like that's such a unique sound you guys have. I think you know what I think it's it's true and and um one thing we never tried to follow trends you know yeah. we know we, we it was we had quite a sim simple formula really we just tried to record the best songs we've got in the best way we could but yeah. we weren't trying to sound like anybody else um also it was especially for 1961 when we first got together it was very unusual to have a keyboard based band there there yeah. weren't many keyboard based bands and we also always featured three part harmonies yeah. uh, rod was in the the cathedral choir in St Albans and he understands harmonies very well yeah. and so it made us sound different and when we first started off i think it quite possibly lost its work because we didn't sound like every other band of the time we sounded different um, and, and even maybe when we started making records you know uh radio stations and uh, and the media like to be able to slot you they like to say this is a, a certain kind of band yeah. but it was always very hard to to slot us you know um and we were just so very fortunate to have two wonderful writers in the band who became very prolific writers yeah. and i think their songs have a timeless sense about them yeah. that very few bands are fortunate enough to have. I just wanted to tell you a quick story. Uh, when the box set was released, and I think it was about 1999, it was yeah. around or 2000 or around there, yeah. um, I had a solo band at the time. And we were asked to play at the Jazz Cafe in London where they launched the box set. Oh, cool. And I had absolutely top, session players in the band a wonderful band yeah and we were, we were playing now i knew the guys were all coming it was a packed packed place and, and suddenly i could see them coming through the crowd <laughs> walking towards the stage all the original zombies and i thought what what are they doing why are they and i could see them walking up the stairs coming onto the stage and the, i didn't know they were going to do this I certainly hadn't rehearsed anything i thought maybe they were going to say something Anyway, they walk on stage and they just talk to the guys in the back. Do you mind if we just play? And I thought, what are we going to play? <laughs> so say it was um, say it was 1999. We haven't played since 1967. What's, what's that? What is it? Is it 30 years? years? 25 years? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Going on for 30 years. We haven't played. We hadn't rehearsed anything. And so, I mean, there was a lot of what are we going to play going on behind me? And yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> anyway, we played Time of the Season and she's not there. And do you know what? We'd had no rehearsals and we haven't played together for nearly 30 years. It sounded great. It sounded really good and quite different to the session guys. The really wonderful players. It's yeah. not too, I'm not diminishing them as musicians yeah it was just different Feel. with uh with the zombies and that's you know what that's the first time it really came home to me that what's that saying about the sum of the parts are greater than the right. individuals or whatever and right. that's true of the zombies there's only one standout musician in the zombies and that's rod and the rest of us are okay except when we get together and then suddenly, and who knows what, suddenly something happens. Yeah. And uh, I think there are a lot of bands like that, that on their own, they probably w wouldn't have had anywhere near as much success as they have. But just when they come together, something happens. It's that magic ingredient of all you guys together, that's that spark. You know, you yeah. need to make that magic it, happen. It's really funny. but it, and, and it just... It amazes me that that's the first time I really realized it. Up until then, I just thought, well, the zombies, this this is us. This is just what we do. Yeah. I know the, know these guys all my life. This yeah. is what we do. But on that evening, I thought, you know what? It is quite unique what we do. That's the first time it struck me. <laughs> and uh, it was quite an eye opener for me. Oh, you've been away from it for so long. It was like hearing it fresh mm -hmm. airs again. They all oh, know those guys. Oh, that's us. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was, it was quite like that. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I got a couple of a couple more questions for you before I wrap up, and don't, I can talk to you for the next six hours. But a um, couple of fun questions for you. What are you listening to these days? I'm. Um, I always get a bit embarrassed when I ever get into this area of an interview because I tend to listen to just favorite albums over and over again, okay. and um, there are one or two modern things that I listen to. If I can, um, I. I mean, Blue, Joni Mitchell's Blue album. Oh. I, I'm word perfect on that. Um, I'm, I'm really, really keen on a singer-songwriter called Duncan Brown, who was actually a friend of mine. Sadly, he, he's no longer with us. And I do recommend anyone to try Duncan Brown. Uh, just wonderfully intelligent lyrics and a beautiful uh, guitar player. Yeah. But I mean, there are, I, I tell you a song I really like at the moment, 25 by Lake Street Drive, I've been listening to a lot. Oh, sure. And there's, yeah. uh, there's another song that I think was a hit in America, not a hit here. See, I listen to songs over and over again. Yeah. The song called Can We Talk? I don't listen to the hit. I listen to it by uh, a, a singing group called Sheer Element. It's absolutely fantastic. And I listen to that over and over again. I listen to Argent a lot. This morning, I was, I was checking out one of their songs this morning. I'm not going to tell you which one because I might re-record it. So I don't want to <laughs> say what it was. I was just looking at um, what, what I've been listening to recently. And there, there's some of the things that I've been listening to. Um, but I'm not... I'm not someone that has that plays music all the time. I mean, I don't know if you can. I don't see if you can see. Great library behind you. Can you see some guitars over there? Oh yeah. So when I'm listening to music, very often I'm playing it. I yeah. sit sit in this room. This is my yeah. sort of music room, and I sit here and I I just play for hours. That's and so nice. More more than listening to other people. I'm I'm just playing. Oh, what wow. a wonderful! My my parents. It was very hard for them, but they bought me a guitar when I was about twelve. What yeah. a wonderful yeah. gift to give to someone—a lifetime's gift. My dad was really worried it was going to be a three-day wonder, <laughs> uh, and, and you know I would be bored after a year or two. Yeah, and, you know I've been playing for mm, probably about nearly seventy years now, and yeah. I'm I'm still only an okay guitarist. I can write songs, but I'm, yeah. I'm not. Really, but the pleasure I get from just sitting and playing tunes yeah. is just incredible. And I do recommend to anyone, if you're at all tempted to start playing an instrument, do it. Do, do. It doesn't matter how good you get. Just get the best you can. Put a bit of effort in. And, you know, what you get out equals what you put in. Uh, but yeah. you don't have to be a concert pianist to enjoy the, the piano. No, it's just what you get out of it. And if it makes you happy... You know, yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. That was um, that was me learning drums as a kid. Was like I learned um, wipe out for the safaris was one of the first. I, yes, yeah, great drumming song. And then time of the season was one of my first ones because the timing of that's so weird. And I was like, how does he do that? And I had to figure out what drums were, what cymbals were going on. That was like a multi arm thing. And I was like, it is quite unusual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I tell you what, you 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 know if your parents love you. If they buy you drums, yeah. that is the biggest proof of love. <laughs> my, my parents are absolute angels for ruining many weekends playing the drums in the basement. <laughs> because I'd be like, yeah. Can I play the drums, and they'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, That's soon down proof, of, proof of true love, I think. Though. Absolutely, yeah. Though they, yeah, best parents ever. Um, do you have any favorite movies? Um. Oh my goodness! Aren't I terrible? I go to the movies so rarely. I didn't. I did an article. Have I got my notes here? I did an article the other day about the, uh, my favourite cinema recently that I that I'd been to. Oh, I was hoping it was going to be in this book, and um, it was in the the Roxy Hotel in New York, and yeah. we were staying there uh, before we were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and most of the people who were being inducted. We're staying at the Roxy Hotel. It's a very sort of, if I don't know, if I said it's a rock and roll hotel, you know, it's all um, steel girders and chrome and um, very yeah. modern. And in the basement, they have the Roxy Cinema, which has probably got about a hundred seats, but it actually feels quite small. Yeah. And uh, it was it was a great way of breaking the sort of the, the tension of waiting to go and perform 
at the rock and roll um, induction ceremony to go down there to that cinema. So that that was a magical place. Yeah. And and the song uh, and the film we saw was wow was something on Beale Street. The <laughs> film I saw there was called If Beale Street Could Talk. It's directed by Barry, Barry Jenkins, huh. and it's based on a book by James Baldwin. And it, it was a lovely experience to to be in this very special hotel. Yeah. And to go to this unique little cinema that sort of specializes in art films, you know, uh, first run independent films and rare, rare uh, 35 millimeter cut classics and things like that. Yeah. Um, it, it was it was a lovely experience. But I don't go to the cinema that much over here because oh. people are always you know, eating. Uh, what is it? Uh, popcorn behind you and talking and yeah. uh, unwrapping sweets and things like that so <laughs> i've uh, i should get back into it because i really enjoy the cinema yeah. but i uh, sort of gave up after one or two strange experiences <laughs> i thought i i uh, i'd rather just watch things on this on the tv at home oh for sure um well last question for you colin uh kind of a big one but what do the zombies mean to you and what's next for the group well i mean the zombies mean a lot to me. They they changed my life forever. Yeah. Um, I would have never thought that I could have had a career in the music industry. But through the zombies, I have had a career in the music business. And in particular, because of Rod Argent and his genius. Yeah. Um, so it means lifetime friendships, um, adventures that I never even dared dream of traveling around the world playing the music I love with my pals. I mean, what more can you ask for? It's, it was just incredible. <laughs> so it, it has been wonderful. I hope that we'll record many more songs. Yeah. And um, I hope maybe I'll even write a couple of them myself. I'd really like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe we'll play a few selected gigs as well. But as a touring force, I, I don't think the zombies will be taking on any uh, um, you know la large long tours anymore yeah. I, I think that's it now and maybe that's all for the best you know yeah health um, comes first yeah health, exactly we're not you know <laughs> I always like to say we're just coming into our prime but um, <laughs> probably would be a little bit of an exaggeration <laughs> and um, I, maybe we should slow down a bit although you know I hope to be touring with my solo band and when we played at the Zombies Festival last weekend, we got a great reaction. So um, yeah. I do hope to be touring with my solo band. And we will, of course, play some of the Zombies classics when we tour. That's so exciting. Um, Colin, this has meant the absolute world to me. Thank you so much for an hour of your time. Um, yeah, highlight of my life to be able to chat with you for a little bit. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thanks, Giggins. And thank you for having me on your show. And if I've... Uh, if I've hesitated a little bit and things like about the film and so forth, uh, I, I apologize, but I, I've really enjoyed having a chat with you. And oh, thanks so much for having me on your show. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Cheers, mate. All the best. Thank you, sir. Take care. I'll see you soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>